As you saw from the intro today, I'm going to be showing you how to build a gaming PC for a super cheap price. So if you'd like to skip ahead to the benchmarks or the build tutorial, then you can look at the content section there. But firstly, I'm going to take you over the parts I chose and why. Kicking it off with the CPU, or in this case an APU. An APU is actually a GPU and CPU chip combined into one. AMD sent over their latest, highest end APU for this build, the A10 7870. It's got a GPU chip inside of it clocked around 800 megahertz, and the CPU goes up to about 3.9 gigahertz. It's a really fast, uh, really fast APU, uh, which is great. It's one of AMD's higher end APUs. It's got four cores, which is another big plus, making it compatible with the likes of GTA 5. A lot of the latest AAA titles are now requiring a minimum of four cores. Housing all of our components is the motherboard. I went for the Asus A68HM Plus. It's got HDMI output allowing for free sync over HDMI. I'll get onto that in a moment's time. It's also got upgradability as well. Uh, so you can add in a graphics card to this build if you wanted to, say six or 12 months down the line. Uh, just pick up something like an RX 460, 470, or a GTX 1050 or 1050 Ti. And this motherboard supports that straight away. Just plug it into the PCI uh, 3.0 header on the board. Uh, it's also got a good I.O. USB 3 and USB 2 and SATA connectivity for a load of drives. For RAM, I went for Crucial Ballistic Sports Elite. Now this RAM comes clocked at 2133 MHz and I went for a 2x4GB kit. And that's for a couple of important reasons. Uh, whereas a traditional GPU would have its own super fast GDDR5, uh, GDDR5X or HBM memory, an APU system simply doesn't. Uh, it instead shares the DRAM or the system RAM. Uh, so for that you need something fast, hence why I went for a 2133 MHz speed. And you need something with a lot of bandwidth, hence why I went for two four gigabyte dims as opposed to one eight just a couple of notable points plus the ram looks pretty sick for storage i went for my good old favorite the wd blue one terabyte you can also go for a seagate barracuda as well if you wanted to uh, just stick to something that's 7 to 200 rpm and from a reputable retailer and brand make sure it's on the sata 3 interface and that it's nice and fast and you are sorted if you want to add an ssd into this build later on down the line uh, you are more than welcome to do so that's another great upgrade path but for now one terabyte of capacity gives you loads of room for your movies music and your games for the case, I went for Thermaltakes Versa H21. I actually just uploaded a review of this case, which you can check out in the card section now. Uh, it's a very, very cheap case. There are some bits of it that I would change. However, it's a very nice case. You've got front panel USB 3, USB 2, uh, HD audio as well on the front, a headphone microphone, plus a big side panel window. Cable management isn't the best in the world, but the price is ridiculously cheap. And much like all the other components, I'll leave links to them in the description below. And to wrap it all up, the power supply. I went for EVJ's 500 watt 80 plus certified unit. Not only does this allow for more than enough wattage for our build, it's 80 plus certified, meaning it's like not gonna explode, but that 80 plus certification is a universally recognized standard across power supplies. It just guarantees its efficiency of over 80%. It's also got enough headroom to allow for the upgrade of graphics cards later on down the line. You want something like an RX 470, GTX 1050, you can put that in no problem without upgrading the power supply and I'll leave links to some recommended GPUs in the description below. But that's enough of me, let's head over to the tutorial and then over to some benchmarks. Now time for the tutorial. First we're going to take the motherboard out of its box and then out of its anti-static wrapping. Then you're going to place the motherboard back on the box it came in and remove the CPU and CPU cooler from their box and packaging. This 7870K that AMD sent over is their highest end APU and comes with an improved stock cooler. As you can see, it isn't quite as good as their Wraith cooler, which comes included with their higher end FX chips, but it's a huge improvement over traditional stock coolers. Now pull up the metal arm on the CPU socket and find the golden triangle on the CPU. Align this with the plastic triangle on the motherboard socket and drop the CPU straight in. The CPU has pins on it and these are very fragile, don't touch them. These should go straight in the corresponding holes in the motherboard. This socket from AMD is called their zero insertion force socket. You don't need any pressure, you just need to be nice and gentle and if in doubt, don't worry, just start again. Now 
Now it's RAM time. In this case, I'll be using two 4 gigabyte DIMMs of crucial RAM clocked at 2133 MHz. Find the notch in the RAM and align it with the notch on this Asus motherboard. Unclip the clips on the RAM DIMM slots and slot the RAM in. Apply even pressure to each side, preferably using both hands and repeat this for the second DIMM of RAM. The two clips on the RAM DIMM slots will clip nicely into the sides of the RAM and back down. You shouldn't be able to pull the ramp back out. Once again, if there's a problem, don't panic, just start again. Next is the installation of the CPU cooler. You could do this with the motherboard installed into the case, but it's easier to do it now. Stock coolers are an absolute breeze to install, especially compared to third party counterparts. The thermal paste comes pre-applied and this is gonna link the heatsink of the cooler to the CPU, creating a nice thermal bond. And there's no need whatsoever in removing and adding your own. Align the two metal brackets on either side of the CPU cooler to the plastic brackets on either side of the socket on the motherboard and pull these over. Then take the plastic arm with the cooler aligned, pull this over. This will clamp the CPU cooler up to the CPU. It will go quite tight and you will need to apply a little bit of pressure. All that's left to do now is to take the cable from the cooler and plug it into the white fan header just above the CPU socket on the motherboard. The cable is a tad too long so just tie it in a loose knot and that's the CPU cooler done. That will just get rid of any excess cable slack. This case is kind enough to come with standoffs pre-installed. Because we're using a micro ATX board, we will need to screw two more standoffs in. The standoffs look like this and they're made out of brass. These protect the motherboard from grounding out onto the sheet metal of the case. We'll need to install these two standoffs into these two holes. In order to figure this out, just hover the motherboard over the tray and check to see whether there are standoffs underneath each hole on the board. Simply use your hand to install these two and no tools are needed here. If you've got very weak hands, a pair of needle nose pliers can also be a nice addition. Grab the IO shield from the motherboard box. This will label the ports on the back of the motherboard to help you when you plug things in. This simply snaps into the back of the case with each four corners, giving a reassuring click. But be careful, the metal here can be sharp. Make sure all four corners are in properly and that the text is facing outwards. The holes for audio jack should be at the bottom with old school PS2 keyboard and mouse connectors at the top. Slide in the motherboard, aligning the standoffs with the holes on the motherboard. Ensure all ports are through the back of the IO shield and use these screws to screw the motherboard in. You may drop some screws so a magnetic screwdriver and screwdriver length extensions can be very useful. Screw in a cross pattern and make sure to tighten up after. Now it's power supply time. Take the PSU out of the box and leave the cables tied together for the time being. In this case, I'm opting for a fan up orientation. Slide the unit in and take the screws that look like this to screw the unit in. Once again, do this in a diagonal cross pattern. Now time to do some wiring. Take the power supply cables and separate the 20 plus 4 pin cable, the biggest by quite a large margin, along with the 4 plus 4 pin CPU power cable. Put all of the other cables to the side for the moment. Clip the 20 pin and 4 pin blocks together and plug this into the large 24 pin motherboard connector. This is on the right hand side of the CPU socket, around halfway down, you really can't miss it. For CPU power, we need just one 4-pin block. Separate these two out and run the cable to the top left corner, above and to the left of the CPU. This is a bit finicky to install, given how close everything is nearby. To finish off plugging stuff in, take the black wire from the rear fan and plug this into the header next to the one we used for the CPU cooler earlier. Just a little more wiring later and that's all. Now for storage, take one of the hard drive sleds and the hard drive for the build. Bend the sled, allowing the two notches on either side to fit into two of the three screw holes on each side of the hard drive. 
make sure the connectors are on the opposite side to the clips at the end of the sleds and slide the hard drive back into the cage. This will make sure we can plug our cables in. First we need to give it data and power connections. Take the SATA data cable from the Asus motherboard box. We'll plug the side with the right angle connector into the drive. It will only go in one way as the connector is an L shape. It will also give a satisfying click once in. Then take the other end and install this into a SATA port at the bottom at right hand side of the motherboard. It doesn't really matter which one you use but if you're installing multiple drives i.e. two hard drives, an SSD and a hard drive just keep note of which one is plugged into which connection. Finally we need to give the drive power. Take the power cable that looks like this. It has a capability to power up to two or three hard drive or SSDs but will only use one of the connectors. This doesn't give a reassuring click so you will need to add some pressure. Just don't force it because if you break the power supply power connector you're screwed. It can be a tad stiff but once it's connected uh, it will be absolutely fine. Tidy these wires away nicely and it's also a good time to cable tie all the other cables up back here. Finally we need to finish up the last bit of wiring. All we're doing here is plugging the ports and connectors from the front of the case into the motherboard. First take the HD audio connector, we need to plug this into the appropriate port on the motherboard. All the locations of connectors will be in your motherboard manual, but who needs them anyway? Just look for the pins with the corresponding pin blocked out and plug it in. It's the same case for USB and there's normally multiple USB 2 headers, but don't worry they'll all work the same. Now for the worst connectors you will ever plug in. These are called front panel connectors and for these you will need the manual. Top tip here, make sure the positive connectors and pins go to the positive ones on the motherboard and vice versa. Don't panic if you get these wrong, nothing will explode, your PC just won't turn on. And that's it, all that's left to do now is boot into the motherboard BIOS. Plug your PC into a monitor and mash the delete key after you press the power button. You then want to go into advanced mode in the Asus BIOS and change the RAM frequency manually to DDR3 2133MHz. This is very important and will make sure that the APU has access to the fastest amount, fastest speed of RAM possible. And that's it, your new budget PC is built, it is complete. The real question though, how does it perform? So let's plug it into this FreeSync LG monitor, which supports FreeSync over HDMI. AMD were kind enough to send this over and run some performance benchmarks to find out. And that's it. If you did enjoy this video, please do drop a like rain and maybe even subscribe. Consider sharing this video or maybe even checking out some of the other content on your screen now. A final thanks goes out to AMD and Asus for making this video possible. But as always, we'll see you in the next GeekWatt video.